Uh, let's remember Brother Bud in prayer this morning. He's in the hospital. Uh, his her situation with his hernia, and he's being operated, I believe, r right now or about now. So, um, as I know the Lord is able to undertake, doesn't matter what age we are, so praise the Lord. Yes, other requests this morning. Your aunt. In palliative care, yes. Yes, I understand that. All right, let's all lift up our voice together, Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne of grace. Lord, you see in this moment of time, Lord, as we have come, Lord, to fellowship with thee, Lord. But, Lord, we remember, Lord, those that have been asked, Lord, for a prayer at this time, Lord, that you would touch their body, Lord. Unless you undertake, Lord, Lord, you know the situation. I just pray not only touch their body, but lift them up in spirit as well. And, Lord, there may be even unspoken requests here. I know, Lord, you know all the thoughts of all men. And, Lord, I just commit this service in your hands. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated at this time. I'm going to have a brother come lead us in the song service.
have a number?
We do number 69 in the blue book.
testify this morning, but at work they've had me training people. I, one time it was seven or eight days straight, 12 hour shifts. They were all day, day shifts, of course, but <clears throat> I had a run in with one of the other operators, and some of the guys at work are pretty lazy on the other shifts. Well, some of them are lazy on my shift. And they were really, they were taking advantage of the part time workers that were there, and I kind of stepped up and said, nope. I said, you guys are going to have to do your share of the work. And anyway, so they called some people from upstairs, and they came down. But I didn't, I didn't, I was kind of mad on the inside, because uh, they're really treating them like dirt sometimes, the part-time. And, uh, and anyway, I just, I, I just not even a 20-second prayer, and I said, Lord, help me. I said, I don't want to fly off at the handle, but they're really... I said, I'm training these people to run a certain machine and they're getting taken advantage of. So one of the supervisors came from upstairs and I told them what was going on. They left a mess out back because in their minds, those guys were supposed to clean all that stuff up and they just sit there and watch the machine run for anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour on end without doing anything. And I'm just so thankful that the Lord helped me and he agreed with me and he went over and talked to them and he made them. So I think maybe things are going to change a little bit for them too. And I, I was worried about it because I finally said somebody's got to step up because they're really getting treated like bad, real bad. And I'm just thankful to the Lord that he gives us grace yeah. as long as we don't go half cocked off the, <laughs> fly off the handle. And uh, the guy from upstairs agree with me and things are going to change. So he says, and we'll see what happens. And I'm just thankful to the Lord.
This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you, with all Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Lord, for being so good to me. When I was all alone, you took me in, your great family. You gave me new hope, said that I will live eternally. Now with all my heart, I thank you, Lord. With all my heart And with all my soul I thank you for Calvary And the riches untold I thank you for heaven fair And a place you prepare me snares and trials seem so hard to bear it's then that I reach for the hand I know it's always there and knowing you still care I bow my head and I say a little prayer thank the Lord this morning for this truth. So many things out there and this fellow worker has sent me some literature and I'm just thankful that we are men that God used and set things straight. Some of the stuff out there is pretty messed up. This past few weeks, uh, I had this gentleman on my my heart. Jeremy's friends, uh, it'd be their dad. He's dying of cancer, and he's about my age. And I've gotten really close to his sons. So they keep coming to the house very well-mannered boys and and uh, the doctors has given up hope last time they checked them the cancer had just spread all over and uh, yesterday they took him for a train ride he's never been on the train before so the whole family got on the train in Moncton and they went up to Amherst and Jeremy used our van and went and pick, picked them up in Amherst I just thought his days are numbered, and an awful hard thing to go through. And uh, I 
We're just thankful that we know the Lord and we have His comfort. Just can't manufacture a thing. I just wish. the Lord would work and that I could just go lay my hands on him and he'd be healed. It's certainly been in my heart and prayer and I still remember the the day that we were with Andre's cousin and she passed away right in front of us at the age of 34 years old. And I did pray to God and I was holding her hand and uh, as the machines were all shutting down and finally her heart went, I thought, wow, has this really happened? But, uh, unless the Lord steps in, I, I really believe there's hope in Him and, and miracles, but it has to, there's a reason for everything that happens at a time, at a moment, and, and place, and of all the different literature that I have read and through Mary Well and Brenham and, and the walk of Jesus Christ. There's places that they, they walked on, but there's other places that they were sent and, and uh, life were spared, and even life came back from, from, from the dead. And, we serve quite a mighty God. I'm just thankful that I know him this morning. Amen.
Israel. They were trapped at the Red Sea. By that mean old Pharaoh and his army, they had water all around them. Pharaoh was on their tracks. From up nowhere, God stepped right in. He made a highway like that don't you know that he's an on time oh god he is oh yes he is oh he's an on time god oh he is oh yes he is well he may not come when you want him but he'll be there right on time oh he's an on Oh, yes, he is. You can ask the 5,000. Oh, they were hungry souls that he fed. By that old river with two fish and five loaves of bread. Oh, the miracles he performed for the multitude. What he did way back then, he'll do today for me and you. Don't you know that he's an on time? Oh, God, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, he's an on time God. Oh, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Well, he may not come when you want him to, but he'll be right on time oh he's an on time god yes he is oh yes he is oh he's an on time god he is oh yes he is oh he's an But he'll be there right on time For he's an on-time God Yes, he is Oh, yes, he is Oh, yes, he's an on-time Oh, God He is Oh, yes, he is He's an on-time God Oh, he is when you want him to but he'll be there right on time for he's an on time God yes he is yes he is oh yes he's an on 
one time God Oh he is Oh yes he is He's an on time God Oh he is Oh yes he is Well he may not come When you want him to But he'll be there Right on time Are you happy this morning? Yes. I'll praise the Lord. God's children has a right to be happy. I know sometimes we go through a lot of things, but the Lord knows everything. And like Gary was saying, he knew that before the foundation of the world. You know, he knew every act that we would do down here. Wow. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come at this part of the service, we thank you, Lord, for thy presence here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for having, keeping your eye upon thy children at this time. We thank you, Lord, that you're looking at thy nation, Israel, as well. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this morning. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Beyond a shadow of doubt, we're living here at the end time. And it was about 20 years ago, I believe 1997, 98, that God had a man on the scene, an apostle, that God showed him about a war that's about, we're not too far down the road. It's to take place, and it's been 20 years, and when, the, when he had that vision, it seems like we were expecting it the next week. But God does not always fulfill his word next week. There's time he does things immediately, and another time it takes a, while, a space of time before God actually moves on in whatever he wants to do. And I know like... On the news media, there's a lot of buzz going around. Uh, what's going on? What's happening? And and to the people of the world, they're nervous. 
because they don't know how this is going to, fo- going to unfold. We've seen how that the U.S. went into Syria and bombed a few places. And I'm sure everybody was wondering, wondering, well, is Russia going to get involved? Because if it does, then it's no longer just Syria and the Middle East. It's over here, too. But it's not time for it yet. No, sir. Actuality, what we're actually seeing, as I mentioned a little bit last week, in 2010, first of all, God's word has to be fulfilled, no matter what. No matter how things look at or what they, what they are, what's taking place. There's, two, there's three objects that are coming to completion that's moving towards that week of Daniel. One is the bride of Jesus Christ. That's where, what we're looking for. And we know the Lord, it's the Lord's doing what he's doing. But on the other side of things, there's also the B system has to be set in place. And we know that's that fourth beast that Daniel saw, that John saw in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. It's come out of, out of water. The water means the Mediterranean Sea, because that's where it had its all these uh, other empires had its border too that had something in common with them. But as we look at it, we've seen from World War II how that the head, which is Europe, it took a, quite a while for that to come together. And there was other things that took place back then. Remember how the Berlin Wall and things got very heated in 1962 that we almost came to nuclear war with, with uh, Russia? I remember the B-52 bombers flying overhead, and I know they were heading for Russia, armed with nuclear weapons. They were about two minutes from the point of no return. There was also the, yeah, the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. There was a situation where there. But the whole thing was just that it seems like the time clock just came almost close to midnight. But it was not time. It could not happen because God has certain things in his word to be fulfilled no matter what man tries to do. It can't change what God knows. And I'm thankful, and and through us being the true child of God and living in this hour, we have peace in knowing. No, it doesn't have peace that the devil won't tempt you or things like that, but we have peace in knowing that where we're standing on God's word. And although they fired the missile, they was up there late at night and said, well, oh, they went at it. I wasn't concerned. Because if we know what's in the word of God, we... Can have a, we don't know every detail, every skirmish that will happen on the earth, but we have a knowledge that the body of the beast has to be made prepared for that coming of the week. And it is God's doing that he does this. God has some tools in his hands that he causes, allows things to take place in the world. He sent angels. Now, angels don't only affect the ministering, uh, those that are ministering, whether good or bad, but it also affects nations, how they deal with one another and so forth. And so knowing that though in the week of Daniel, when that begins, that the body of the beast is to be joined to the head of the beast. That's uh, an assurity in the word of God. Because the scripture is not declaring a half of a beast. A full one. And the body of the beast represents where the three remaining empires were before. And that's all around that Mediterranean Sea. The body of the beast as you came after World War II, wasn't, yes, there were some changes. Israel became a nation and there were some skirmishes. But as far as the Muslim world, they were pretty well in all the same way that they've been for 100 years. But in 2010, as the populations of different countries, the average man on the, on the street, hey, why can't we have a little bit of taste? Not that we want to go worldly like the Western world, 
But here's our leaders. They're living like Caesars and kings. And here we are in desperate times. And they abuse us. So one man burned himself in effigy in 2010 in Tunisia. That set a fire. It's not a fire with a match. But it's a fire that started slowly. Just like the head of Europe took time for it to come together, so will this body of the beast. And as I was looking at the situation, Syria and Turkey is about the only ones left that has to have, be dealt with or to brought to its place to be made ready for the week of Daniel. All these nations have been touched by this fire revolution. They took a hit. They weren't as strong as they were before 2010. Some did because of Russia giving them some weapons. But this war in Syria, guess what? Here's Putin. He's buddy with Bashar, uh, Bashar Assad. Now, will he be the leader in the time of the miracle war? We don't know that. But definitely, it's causing turmoil in those immediate countries round about. And the thing that I see, Russia is backing Syria. And what brings to mind is Ezekiel 38 and 39. Yes, that miracle war will take place. And Israel will capture all the land. Right up to the Euphrates River, which is in Iran. Actually, they go further in some of the scriptures we've seen of that miracle war. They go up to Nineveh and then back down to the Euphrates River. Because the promise God gave Abraham is from the Euphrates River to the little river Wadi Ali, which is in the Sinai Desert just below in this area here. But Damascus, well, maybe, is right there. That's part of Syria, isn't it? That Israel is going to belong, is going to own it. And, and Bashar is not going to give it to Israel. No, sir. Well, that's not what I want to point here this morning. It's the relationship of Syria that Russia is involved with them. Russia won't be able to do anything when that miracle war takes place. First of all, God's going to divinely intervene in that war. And God don't care what kind of high-tech military equipment you have. When he says, I'm going to put them in their land, they're going to be placed in their land, and he's going to do it quickly. We've seen the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 14, when Judah and Ephraim, which is the 12 tribes, go to the east, which goes to the Mediterranean Sea. That's what they conquered in 1967. But they says that it will also go to the east. Now that's a, it's in the same sentence, but it is two events. And as the time comes when Israel will take all that land, in Ezekiel ch chapter 38 and 39, it talks about God said he would put a hook in the jaw of Russia, or Gomer, Gog and Magog. What is that hook? Do the Russians care about that Hajj where they, the Muslims celebrate and they walk around that little hut by the thousand, almost millions? The Russians couldn't care one thing about that at all. But their economic ties is with the nation that is infiltrating itself in. And in the miracle war, as God takes away Syria and other nations that... that is that Russia is dealing with, they're going to be upset. They'll want that back. That's why in the second war, in the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39 now, that's when God is going to deal with Russia. And Russia will, after that Ezekiel war, 
is over. Russia will never be a major player in the world ever again. And so when I seen that, well, I said, this is preparing the groundwork. Yes, as far as Syria being in disarray and, and how it's affecting a little bit of Turkey, it's just in the plans of God because the people inside wants to get rid of those dictators and leadership. And they want a little bit of freedom and liberty and taste a little bit of the material things of this world. And so therefore, that's the underground current that's in the average person that's walking on the street. If they can get rid of those leaders, and of course, those dictators are pretty cruel. But when it is, when Ezekiel 38 and 39 is done, then those people will have been dealt two things. Number one, they'll no longer believe in Allah. Because it's in the war with Ezekiel 38 and 39, and also in the miracle war. It, oh, here. In the miracle war, God just deals with the Jewish half brother and the Egypt along with it. Those nations that will be involved in that when Israel takes that land, these leaders that will be there at that time and the people on the ground will see a God that's real in action, not my God can do this and this is the arm of Allah and all that kind of junk. They'll see actually something on ground they can't deny. Just like when Moses crossed the Red Sea, Pharaoh saw the hand of God. That pillar of fire that was in the days of Moses is going to appear again and work with Israel in that miracle war. But what will it do? It will erase from those in that immediate area concerning that miracle war. They'll no longer believe in Allah. They'll say, is the God of Israel is the God of, of, that is God. That's why they will bring gifts to Israel. My. Something had to change. Right now they'll bring bullets, bombs, anything else. Throw rocks. You know, how it goes. But after that miracle war, and like I mentioned many times, just another war, on the, just for the sake of a war, does not change the gods and the mentality of those Arabs that are in the Middle East. But when, it's just like us Christians. When God decides to do something and becomes on ground, somebody's going to change their mind to know what the truth is. Okay, God's not going to play around to confirm everybody's little revelation, every little move, every denominations. They'll see a God that's real. And the evidence will be there on ground. You can't say, well, when Israel puts up her temple, you can't say, well, no, it can't be now. It's going to be in the millennium. Hey, it's there. Got two eyes. Can't you see it? So they'll have to read, look at their revelation. So now concerning the Middle East countries, when, it's, when those will be liberated, it's done in two parts. The miracle war does the nations that are round about. That's the territory of Israel. But in the Ezekiel war, now that deals with all those other Muslim nations. God's not going to use Israel in that Ezekiel war because it's a surprise attack. It says, they come like a cloud as a surprise. As a cloud, why? With airplanes, that's where they fly, in the clouds. There's not some soldier walking on a cloud coming towards Israel. Somehow with te technology, whether it is by a virus or whatever it means, by the, an EMP, they can blind Israel just long enough that they make a secret attack as a cloud to come to take the land of Israel. And that's when Russia is backing them up with their equipment to do it. But when that comes on the scene, God that is God, that made the planets, that made the, the whole universe. I mean, if he can create that, 
what's a little puny army on a puny little planet somewhere in the solar system? Or in a galaxy somewhere? It's nothing to him. But Job holds the record of what God's going to do in that day. He says, I reserve the hail for the time of war. Now, for the time of war, that hail is not going to be a little uh, golf ball size hail, although that would hurt quite a bit if you were outside. It talks about hail in the terms of 60 to 100 pounds. Uh, that would be 50 or 60 kilos if you're metric. Now, it doesn't say the exact weight, but it's weight enough that whatever aircraft comes in, God destroys them with his weather maker. That's why it talks about in Ezekiel 38 39 that they'll take seven, money, seven months to bury the dead because they've been scattered all over with a tornado and, their, and the hail that God's going to bring on scene. They're going to be spread all over the place. And not only that, they have a lot of equipment that comes in with them. It'll take seven months, uh, seven years, I should say, to bury or to, to burn the weapons, to get rid of them. So it's not a little invasion. But what happens when they come in and they want to attack Israel? God will deal with that air Ammon that comes in to destroy Israel. He will cause Europe and the other nation, Gentile nations to fire on Gog and Magog and all the nations that was involved to come against Israel. I was not rejoicing because of what was taking place that we saw in the news how Great Britain, France, and the United States went in after Bashar in Syria. But it's a beginning that Europe, the head of the beast, has to wake up because when this air amah that comes in, you don't have weeks, you hardly have any hours because a plane can fly pretty quick to bring all the military and they have an objective, an objection, um, an object where they want to focus the war with. Although that Israel will be blinded, Europe won't be blinded, the U.S. won't be blinded. And God will purpose in their heart that he'll call for a sword to rain fire on Gog and Magog and all those nations. They'll be put down and Israel won't have to fire a missile to help them. He'll use the Gentile nations to put down Russia and all these other nations. When they are put down, now the thing that's been working since 2010 of that Arab Spring, now... Because their nation's leaders has been got rid of by that war, now they want to express, we want a chance at, at not freedom, but to have liberty to like you have in Europe. And the old Pope will say, well, hey, if you want to be part of this, if you, because you don't no longer believe now, because that's where God will deal with the rest of the Muslim and other gods of the world, when that comes on the scene, it's powerful enough to change the minds of, of leaders of religious denomination, not just denomination, but different religions of the world, that they see something and they drop what they believe in. Because he said he's going to famish not the God, one God of the world, he says God's plural of the world. Why? The event what they see, and they will see it by television, what God is actually doing, and they'll have to bow down and say, the God of Israel is God. Well, we thought was God is not God, because he didn't do anything. But the God of Israel did. It'll be so effective, not that will it only affect those Muslim countries, but it'll affect the Jews as well. Because there's two scriptures in one in Jeremiah, in a, a, well, 25, I believe, chapter 25 somewhere. But there's two scriptures that says, the Jews will no longer say, the God of Moses. If you go talking to Jews today in the land of Israel, they say the God of Moses. The Torah. 
But after this war, they'll say no longer the God of Moses. They'll say the God that's brought us into the land today. Because why? They saw something. God did something. Oh, what a period of time. So, can you see the picture? We don't have all the answer, but we can see it forming. Now, when it is all ready and well, it won't take too much longer because here's Syria up here and Turkey's there. When that is in position and God sees it's the time, he's going to let Israel loose. He's going to initiate that war. He's going to tell the leadership. Now, saying in all of that, that's why the child of God has peace today. Yes, they fired missile. But you can't have a war between Russia and America at this point in time. The reason being, the lamb beast has to be there long enough to protect Europe till it's formed. That fourth beast is, is in place. That don't mean they have to... They're, that they're not touched just before the signing of it, but around that signing of the covenant for the week of Daniel, it's about that time somewhere that America is going to be dealt with by God, not before. There may be skirmishes, there may be things here and there and so forth, but when the time comes that God wants to deal, and why does he deal when the week of Daniel is in the boat ready to start? Because he wants to prepare a place for the Jews to come before the middle of the week. All right. Now, in saying all those things, and that's wonderful to know, and that that's, was fresh meat in 1997-98, although we don't see the fulfillment yet. And I know many of you heard this many times. Maybe not into every detail because as time progresses, yes, we can see how things are moving and being jockeyed in position. But in all that's taken place, From 1963, when God brought a prophet on the scene to open six seals, now man knew how close they were standing towards the end. They didn't know everything, but they knew a whole lot more than they did in the oil message when it started in the 19, at the turn of the century, the 1900s. As that carcass would start to be fed, that carcass would go through the till the seventh seal would be broke. Eagles are hungry. They live on divine revelation. They live on fresh food. Now to say the miracle war is fresh food to someone that never heard it, it is. But if you've been in the message as long as I've been, no, it's not fresh food. It's still food. Why do I say that? When I, came, when I start looking into Luke chapter, the 12th chapter, because while the carcass is taking place during that period of time, which is from 63 till the seventh seal, the Lord came and he's serving meat at the same time. He's serving meat from what? One scripture talks about it's the carcass. Other places he says he's coming to serve meat to servants, plural, down here. So this is all taking place in this period of time. While he's doing that, it says, when he's serving meat, he says, that they open unto him to the fresh meat immediately. I'd have to say to the movement today, they lost that immediate understanding. 
They received it immediately when the seals came. They received it immediately when God had an apostle on the scene, but not in the fivefold ministry time frame. Because the only fresh meat they have is what was from 2005 backwards. But nevertheless, and then things that sometimes present, well, there's only one message. It has to blend with, with Brother Branham and Brother Jackson. And we're being accused that we're preaching three different messages. It's three different continuation on from Brother Branham's message. One is brother, the first watch is Brother Branham. The second watch is Brother Jackson. Now we're in the fivefold ministry. And everything that's being brought here is in dovetail with what Brother Branham brought and Brother Jackson brought. But some will get on the horn and say, no, that's not it. It's not in, in line with what Brother Jackson brought. Because what you're saying is, he'd never said it. Well, Brother Jackson, when he was on the scene, when he started out, they called him a, bla a blackbird. The Branham movement says, he's not consistent with what Brother Branham said. There's things he did, he elaborated on what Brother Branham has brought. But he also brought things that Brother Branham never touched. And so is it in this hour. And if we can't see that, there's nothing I can do. It's in the hands of God. In the dream that Brother Jackson had concerning the, the rock of revealed truth, Now, I just took some clips and put things together. You won't find that on the Internet. When, in that dream, he sees Brother Branham, he's the only one that can take the pinch bar and knew how to work it to open that rock of revealed truth. That was to open truth from it. But then when he was finishing cracking it open... That don't mean there would be other truths that come forth. But what he's seen in the vision, he's seen the people when Brother Branham walked away, said, well, where is Brother Branham? Well, some went this way, they went several ways. Chaos started to break in. That is really what it is. So what caused the chaos? Because God took the one they were hanging their coattail on takes them off the scene, and if they had the Holy Ghost, that, if you want to, if they did have the Holy Ghost to see what the prophet was saying, they should have seen the apostles as he would come on the scene. But because they don't have it, then those that grew up in the days of Brother Branham, under his ministry, they too were in the part where feeding servants that was going to rise up for the next stage when God was now going to start to restore the apostolic ministry which would be part of the Ephesians chapter 4 which is the means to perfect the bride. So as God now starts to move in that direction the movement and I'm sure there were some sincere believers in there and living right and so forth but preachers started to get on the stand and says, he's a blackbird. He's not with us. He's adding things to the word of God. This and that and the other thing. Well, Brother Branham never said that. This. Now, God could put a, a, a stop to the whole thing. But we have, what is it that we have to realize in this hour? God has tools in his hands. Not physical tools like a shovel or a pick or things like that. But God's tools is his word. 
the fan that's in the hand. If things are going to fan, why do you want to fan something out? Because they're going to be chaos. Right? Things are not the same. There's the, tr the, the true seed and then there's the husk or the thing that, you want to blow, that God wants to blow away. God's, well, maybe I should look at certain scriptures too. In his word, we can see in Luke, the 12th chapter, if we want to go there. Now, I don't have to go down verse 36 and 37, 38, showing how the Lord is feeding meat, fresh meat. And we are to open up to him immediately. And I have to say, the word is on ground in this hour. It's the same as was happening in the days of Brother Branham. When Brother Jackson came on the scene, no, they don't. Brother Branham didn't say it. We can't accept it. We have to look at it. We'll have to study it. All that kind of a rigmarole. And it's no different in this hour. But then he talks about that there would be three watches. Now, by saying that there's three, the three watches are three different messages, they don't, the movement don't have a clue what that's about. All they can say is adding to the word of God, is trying to promote yourself and things like that. But it's, in, it's Jesus that said it. He said, what about if I come in the second watch? Or the third? It was a mean of testing. But I want to drop down now because he's got, he goes on to dealing with how the servants would be uh, dealt with in this period of time. Now Luke chapter 12 Luke chapter 12 has its beginning here. The Lord came down to feed me. That is not in the Ephesian church age, nor the next one, but it would be in the seventh one. And so though for, therefore that Luke, where he's feeding meat down here, he says he was returned. If he was returned, that means somewhere he's dealing out Meets to servants. Because when Jesus was here on earth the first time, he didn't say he had to return. He came the first time. I mean, give me a break here. What don't you understand? All right. So now as he's bringing forth meat that would be divvied out in three watches, which will always be consistent with one message. Now, if we want to say one message, well, the whole Bible is one message, too. We want to go to town with that. But here's for, I'm saying for Moncton, for you to understand this morning. Drop down to verse 49. Now remember, all this parable is dealing from 63 till the seventh seal. Had nothing to do with the early church, although it could be typed in one manner if you want to. Because that parable, when it starts, is pointing to you in the end time. And so in verse 49 says, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will if it be already kindled? Lord, why do you want to send a fire? What is the fire? Where does the fire come from? These are all questions we, we need to ask ourselves. Is it burning somebody's field with a match? No. It's the fire of the Word of God that comes from heaven. He's setting things on fire. Why? To burn something up. And to energize, burning in your heart, a true revelation, too. 
So he says, I'm sending. He says, I am come. It's Jesus is the originator of this. I have come to send fire on the earth. And if we're looking at this parable, it's speaking about in these last days, especially at, at the different periods of time when God would deal. That's, we'll see that as we go along. And what will the eye, if it be already kindled? Now he goes on to say here, he gives, he said, now he's talking about himself. He says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. In other words, he was to be immersed into something that he had to do. And with, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. In other words, how difficult is this going to be to be, to be done till it is accomplished? Now he's talking about his day, how he was going to go to Calvary. But look what he says in 51. This goes along with the fire now. Suppose ye that I've come to give peace on earth. Now we can take that and say, oh, is that with the nations of the world? Well, that has a certain part to do, but it's not going to be peace on the earth now, not till the millennium starts. Peace on earth in the religious realm? Is there peace? Whew. There is no peace. Why? Because there's an intellectual tear and there's a true believer. Two different servants. I tell you, nay, but rather division. So who's causing the chaos? No, Jesus doesn't purposely doesn't, but by sending his word, it's an automatic chaos situation. In Luke the, the 11th chapter, verse 53 and the 54, here's Jesus. He's dealing with the leadership that are intellectual believers. They hug on to the Torah, and every, anybody ever says anything against the Torah or anything new, you're a marked man. And so Jesus was marked. This is the leadership, not your people, your average person. It's the leadership where it starts that causes the chaos. And he says, And he said these things unto them, and the scribes and the Pharisees begins to urge. Now the word urge means they held a terrible grudge against him. That's what it means. They held a terrible grudge against him vehemently. In other words, they were really on fire to speak against God's only begotten Son. And they provoked him. To speak of many things. Let's see what you're saying and believe. And what they want to hear is what we can trap you with. Isn't that what happened to Brother Branham with the Pentecostal movement? To Brother Jackson with the Branham movement? What do you think is happening today? I mean, you have to be blind not see what's taking place. They lay in wait for him, seeking to catch something out of his mouth. Ha, you said something that... Our, our forefathers or Brother Brown and Brother Jackson never said that they might accuse him now the accusing is not all, not all always on the pulpit as things are being preached that it happens there too but behind the scenes talking to the congregation or to others yeah he's a bit off uh, he's got an attitude you think now, the Pentecostal had the same spirit that some of those have in the day that Brother Branham was on the scene. My. Who does Brother Branham think he is telling us that tongues are not an evidence? 
they got so heated that they wanted to bring him to that Chicago meeting, not to acclaim him, but to fire something that they could shut him up with. Find something wrong that he could say. But we know what happened there. Yes, God was with the prophet because there was a major event taking place. Not one came up. They can't stand against the word of God. They can only accuse and use other things to do it with. All right. It's the same as the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, when he started preaching the truth, the Jews in that hour done this, was doing the same things. That you'll find in Acts chapter 13, verse 44 to 45, to 46. I'll just read it for you. You can mark, just mark it down if you want. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city to hear the word of God. In other words, God was using the fresh meat to pull people through the Apostle Paul. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. Why were they filled? Now, these are not your, your carpenter working. These are your religious leaders. They were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul. That is all down through man historical history from Adam to now. Satan has not changed his tactics. And they spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. And then Paul and Barnabas whack bold. Well, Paul, don't speak too harsh. Maybe you spoke too harsh to begin with. If you would be just more meek in, in, in presenting what you're saying, maybe we might look at it and accept it. If we can see that our previous leader where we grew up with confirms that those things are real. Intellectual believers. So Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it is necessary that the word of God be first spoken to you. So that's why the word of God, when it comes on ground, is spoken to everyone. But it is God's tool because it's by fire. He said he'll send a fire. And another scripture he talks about he's going to send a sword. You don't use sword for love. You use a sword for separation. And what I'm saying here this morning, why do you think Brother Branham preached in his day the anointed ones at the end time? Was he talking about Catholic priests? Oh, it could have been, but I don't believe that's where he's at. Maybe an Anglican minister. No. Those anointed Pentecostal preachers that was vehemently against what he was saying. And so that's why he preached the message, the anointed ones at the end time. Was that love? Yes, it's love on God's part that he, he was obligated to preach what was given to him so the people could hear it. Then they would be without excuse down the road when God deals with the whole situation. Now let's look at what happened when God moved in the second watch with Brother Jackson. He preached a message, and it was a strange message way back in 73. That's when he was really being grilled by the Brown Movement. He preached a message was, heat it up and throw it out. That's what God wanted him to say. Why heat it up? How do you heat it up? With the fire of the Word of God. Because it'll cause those that are on the wrong side to be heated against it and it'll cause the, the, the true believer to be heated in the sense of being in favor of being instead they would be hot rather than cold can you see the picture 
So when you look at, well, what's going on? There's this group and that group. It's God's doing. He knows from the foundation of the world how to separate this. And we say, well, well, the bride's got to come together, the fivefold ministry got to come together. Not on your ideas and terms. God has allowed this for his purpose, and if we can't see his purpose in it, then you will be not part of it. That's simple. So if Paul could speak boldly, if Brother Branham could speak boldly, because the Spirit constrains, constrains them to speak that way. So Brother Jackson had to speak boldly as well. Yes, there's time he preached love. He was such a meek person and so forth. That's true too. But when truth was being rejected, he had to speak boldly what the truth was for their hour, the living word on ground while you're living, not the, li not the word that was preached in the past of service that God used in their day because that was having its effect for them in their period of time. In this hour, is the three watches of heaven or hell? The judgment seat of Christ, judging the dead in Christ, and the angel judging the quick on the earth. Is that from heaven or from hell? Think it seriously this morning. We're not here to play church. But that a true believer, hey, thank the Lord, there's meat being served. It's fresh. It fulfills Luke chapter 12. We received it immediately. Well, so don't be surprised. One thing about a true revelation. The make believers cannot bring a revelation to kill it. No way. All they can say is assassinate your character. Well, you know, it's, it's off in here and that and the other thing. Now, granted, because I can see why it would be tempting to say that by that element. Because they see some that did go off the deep end and went after a wild revelation. The third day, Johnson Kahn is a prophet. The 2004, the penalty is over and all these other things. There's a whole bunch of things that was being said. That, we can use the scripture and point to it. That's an error. We can use scripture for that. But what, if we couldn't use scripture to point it, then we couldn't say it, it's error. Now, I happen to watch just sometimes to, to see what was, what's going on. And I'm not going to name the preacher. He's an assistant pastor in one of the churches in the States. He's bouncing about the platform like a banny rooster. When I started looking at what he was doing, the more excited he'd get louder and shout at the people as if that was going to get truth across. Truth doesn't come. You don't put truth or revelation in people's heart by just speaking a whole lot louder. To me, that reminds me of what, when I was a young boy, I used to watch cartoon before I was saved. There was this cartoon, Foghorn Leghorn. For some of you of my generation, you know what that is. He knows everything, and he can straighten up that dog. He knows exactly what to do. All the time when you look at it, he's an idiot. Foghorn Leghorn now. I'm not talking about the preacher. You only need to listen for a little while you find out the truth ain't there. But they'll use the word of God. We are part of the bride. Just because someone, because a preacher gets up and says, we are the bride, we are this and that and the other thing. 
You may deceive the intellectual believer, but the true bride that has the Holy Ghost sees right through it. They're going to stand for truth. Well, what does this fire that Jesus was talking about that he was going to send, what is it to do? It's going to burn every worldly idea, every opinion of man what should be, It burns out carnality. That's what it does. Where is the fire coming from? It's from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's built into the word. And through the true child of God, he rejoices because that word that brings him joy burns up the intellectual believers. Now you say, well, yeah, that's just your thought. Well, that's fine. I'm not here to f ask you to follow my coattail, please. If you don't like, there are other things. You can listen online. You can do what you please. But if it be the truth and if you have the Holy Spirit, then we appreciate what God, what the Lord has brought in this hour. I appreciate what the Lord brought in the days of Brother Bram, in the days of Brother Jackson. Now, when I say that, and then what the Lord brought in this hour, you're making three messages. It's not part of the same. It's the same Word of God. It's just you don't see your day. You can discern the skies and the times and that matters of the things that advance, and you can take worldly events and put certain scriptures along. Well, you say, well, that's what you've done this morning when talking about the miracle war. No, that was a true revelation that God brought. Not, that's not I, it's the Lord that brought it to an apostle. But somewhere. Just to finish off, if you want to just mark down in Mark chapter 10, verse 34, here Jesus is saying, Think not that I've come to send peace on the earth. Now if he's not sending peace, what is he sending? I came not to send peace but a sword. Uh oh. But what about your loving Jesus? Yes, he loves it all the souls of men. As many as the Father has given him that's going to come. But he knows he has to use the sword in this hour or in whatever hour that people are living in of their lives, whether what you look in the past, whatever. That sword is always there because it's incorporated in the Word of God. And he says, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now, he's giving that an example. That don't mean, hey, I, I come to the Lord, and they're against me right off the bat. Not necessarily. God can save the whole household. But he's just making the statement that it'll be that sharp when he sends the sword. He says, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. That's looking at it in the individual life itself. In other words, the thing that's going to attack you the most, that will affect you the most, is those of your own household to begin with. Now, if you bring that, if you belong to the household of a church of God, there too, our foe is those from whence they grew up with us. This picture is getting clearer. But how is this all going to come and gel together? Well, God is putting a word on ground, live ground, since 2005. 
But the only time the fivefold ministry will start to see eye to eye and get into, into position, not because men are saying, well, we get along with one another. we got so many preachers on our list here. and That's carnal. But when the Spirit of God comes down in when he's dealing with that miracle war, he's going to be dealing and confirming who knew what and how to walk with God in your hour. Going back to the parable of Luke. Those that knew the Lord's will. And boys, that can be interpreted in a whole lot of ways. Well, when he's talking in Luke, that 12th chapter, he's not talking about the liturgy in church age or the oil message. He's talking about this hour. What is God requiring in this hour? Are we doing like the Branham movement and the Jackson movement? Stick with the message? And what they mean by stick with the message, don't go beyond what Brother Jackson said and what Brother Branham said. Because Jesus can't show anything right now. None that we can accept, you know. I know it, it's the only way to reach. There may be believers in those assemblies that may be wanting to see the truth. But if we walk in darkness, there's something else here, there too. What happens when we refuse to go on? Yes, as God tutors a generation that's going to be the next generation he's going to move on to use for ministering and so forth. All grew up moving in the truth that was in there. But then when God takes that that servant off the scene and he brings another one on the scene, and when you stop, then that light starts moving away from you. And given enough time, it will move long enough and it will be too far down the road that you won't be able to bridge the gap. Not only bridge the gap, but brings I bring into the scripture at the same time. As in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. If I walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me. Now, if, let's say an example. Let's say if I'm in the Branham camp this morning. I'm walking in the light. The blood of Jesus Christ covers me. But Jesus moves on into the realm of an apostle. And rejecting those things that are brought, I'd have to ask a question. I'd ask, like to see what answer they would give. Does the blood cover them that don't walk there? You know it don't. Because it's a continual walk. So if God is moving on, the reason the blood doesn't cover, because they would have to be intellectual believers rather than genuine Holy Ghost believer. Because God knows who's, who the blood is being applied to. That will be the A to Z till he brings them home or the rapture. Or the Pentecostal, the oil message. Take the people in that group. They believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. They believe in walking truth in whatever they understand with. I know there's Trinity and there's oneness and there's all kinds of things. There's been chaos there too. Why was the chaos? Because of the word of God. But as they're sitting there, as God brings the prophet on the scene... And he started ministering some things to get the bride ready. Those things that was being ministered, they spoke against. As they're standing there in their Pentecostal assemblies, does the blood cover for them? No, it don't. I believe these things are starting to open up the eyes of the true believer, differentiating between an intellectual one and a true believer. Again, I'm going to finish off with in Luke, the 12th chapter, when he's feeding meat, he says, open unto him immediately. Unless you believe all the meat has been served already. Why is it like this? Because the Lord 
is the author of allowing his word, no matter what period, to cause a separation. He uses the, the fan, he uses the sword, and he uses the fire. These are all things of containing the spirit, how God makes the separation. And it says in Luke, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, that he would send his angels, not that Jesus comes himself, to remove everything that offend that commits iniquity, everything that teaches wrong doctrines or speak against the truth. So we need to be careful before we label something error. Oh, I don't say it from the pulpit. Yeah, but you may be doing it behind the scenes. Still guilty. This is a serious hour. I'd rather be one of you sitting down here than someone else God would use in this, in this position. But he has to use somebody. And there's more than one apostle. And the true bride of Jesus Christ, those that have the Holy Ghost, will recognize when truth comes on ground. We must be getting pretty close to that miracle war. I can't see it going more than a year or two. Well, that's just my opinion. I kind of look at maybe when Israel may be even celebrating her 70th anniversary. The Arab world is really going to get upset because they'll have their temple. They'll have their, their, their uh, they'll move the embassy of the, the American U embassy to, uh, to Israel, to Jerusalem. So, as it may be, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, praise the Lord. Are you still happy? Would you rather me telling you some fables and some stories? Some experiences. Those things are fine and well. If it's according to the word of God. But what's more important is knowing your and my day. I'm not living in 2004. I'm living in 2018. Surely God has done something in four, almost 14 years. Well, he says, I'm tired of hearing you barking like that. Well, you don't have to listen here. And if you're on the Internet listen to this, don't get upset by listening here. Tune on to your favorite pastors or whoever you would like. Because God's going to prove this out one day. Somewhere, somebody, there's going to be a bride that's going to know what truth is. And it's the leadership of truth that Jesus is going to bring that brings that five-fold ministry together. It's going to be on the Word of God. Because it's the Word of God that does the separation. When he's done with that, then he will have a pure product to deal with. Well, you've been patient. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's just stand. Have the musicians to come at the same time so someone still has a need. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I just pray, Lord, that to walk humbly before thee, Lord, to only speak what the things that you want me to speak in the time, Lord, that you bring things in. And let all glory belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has sent angels to keep feeding this bride, even in this third watch. Now bless my brothers and sisters, I pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask. Amen and amen. You can be seated at this time, have the positions to be here.
in the red book. Yeah. 
Blessed Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your truth. We thank you, Lord, that you chose us, Lord, to help us and guide us through all of this. Lord, just help us all the way to the end. <clears throat> Lord, I ask a prayer for the sick and afflicted. Lord, also my Uncle Francis. Lord, just we can't do anything in ourselves, Lord, but only you can heal. And there's many. Lord, just give us all strength and and myself, I'm so thankful for what I'm hearing, Lord. I know we all are. Lord, just give us guidance and mercies and on the highway. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. I ask this for all your people, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, Lord.